Good morning, Worship Center. How are y'all doing today? All right, someone's fired up. I love that. How are we doing? There are more people fired up? Good, good, good. Welcome, everybody, to church. Welcome to all of you that are watching online. You guys can make your way into the sanctuary. We're going to get started in just a moment. This morning, we're going to start out uh, with a special moment because we are welcoming new members here at WC. So check out the video on the screen. Yes, we love when we get to add new members here at WC. If you guys have any questions about Worship Center, you want to know maybe more about who we are, what we believe, we would love to tell you about Count Me In. So that's the class that the members go through before they decide to become members. Our next one is happening April 7th. You can find out more information at worshipcenter.org slash count me in. It's a great opportunity, truly, to get to know who we are as a church. So if you want to sign up, information is on the screen. All right, everybody, as you're making your way in here, why don't we stand to our feet and get ready to worship this morning? I'm going to read from Hebrews 4. Christ is our great high priest, amen? 14 through 16, it says, so then... Since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. What is the grace that you need to help you when you need it most this morning? You know, we can come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and sometimes we think boldly means we're charging in and we're ready to experience it, and sometimes a bold entrance just looks like a little courageous step. So this morning, whatever you're carrying in through those doors, whatever you're carrying watching online, Christ is our great high priest. He's the one that made a way for us to be reconciled back to God. And we can boldly enter his gracious presence, that gracious throne. So Jesus, we want you in this place right now. Holy Spirit, come. Fill this place. You are our great high priest, Jesus. We want you here, Jesus, and we love you, and we honor you, and we worship you. In Jesus' name. Turn your eyes 
Jesus, your grace, your mercy poured out for us. We'll love you forever. Here on earth and to heaven, I've been washed from the inside. I've been washed from the inside. Oh, what can I say? Cause thank you is not enough. Jesus, your grace, your mercy poured out for us. I will love you forever. Here on earth and to heaven. Wash from the inside. I've been washed from the inside. I've been washed from the inside. We've been washed from the inside. Just begin to thank the Lord. Let it flow. As his presence rests here, let him rest in a room full of gratitude. Let the Spirit of God rest in a room full of gratitude.
So day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise.
you deserve it Cause you are worthy of it all You are worthy of it all For from you are all things And to you are all things You deserve it give praise to our God today. He's worthy of our praise, worthy of our worship. You know, the scripture teaches that God is enthroned on the praises of his people. Just lifting our voice, lifting our hands in worship sets God on a throne. Isn't that amazing? I don't understand it fully, but when we lift our praise, we are saying, He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so I want to invite you, just in your own words, begin to worship, maybe lift your hands. Let's put God in His rightful place to the best of our ability or a human, from a human perspective. We just give God praise and we give Him worship. God, we thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. We thank you for your grace. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the presence of a holy God that is in this place. And we're invited to be in your presence, not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus has done. And so that's what we celebrate today. That's who we worship. We're so grateful for the presence that fills us with your strength and with your peace, with your joy. So God, we love you and we praise you. Give you all praise. You are worthy. So we love you today. Just as we stay in this attitude of worship and praise and a posture of worship and praise and prayer, I want you to go ahead and be seated. We're going to take communion together. And the ushers are going to, going to serve us by passing the bread and cup down each row. And would you grab a piece of bread and a cup of juice, hold on to it, and then we're all going to take it together. You know, Scripture also teaches us before you take communion in a moment like this to examine your own heart. So to do that today, while the ushers are serving, I want to read 1 Peter chapter 2. And, you know, Peter was one of the disciples who saw Jesus in the flesh. He was an eyewitness. He would have heard him teaching, saw the miracles. He would have seen Jesus on the cross, buried in a tomb, but then rose from the dead. So when an eyewitness of Jesus writes something, I hope that it pulls us in a little bit closer to what these words are. First Peter 2 verse 21 says this, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example and you must follow his in his steps. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Would you take a moment, pray like David prayed, Lord, search my heart. If there's any wicked way in me, show me.
I think everybody's been served. Would you stand, please? Let's hold the bread first. This bread represents the body of Jesus. The piece of bread that you're holding was broken off a loaf. And it reminds us Jesus' body was broken for you and for me. And he allowed it to happen. He could have called down angels, stopped it to protect himself. But he willingly allowed. He willingly allowed it to take place because it was for a purpose. So, Lord, as we eat this bread that represents the broken body of Jesus, we remember what Jesus did, the sacrifice, and we say thank you. Let's eat the bread. Let's hold the juice. This cup of juice represents the shed blood of Jesus. When his back was whipped, crown of thorns on his head, nails through his hands and feet, sword piercing his side. Every place something pierced his body, blood flowed. And it was that blood that erased our sin was shed. The blood was shed so that our sin would be washed white as snow. And so as we drink this cup, we remember what Jesus did. Lord, thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins. And as we drink this, we just simply say thank you. Let's drink. God, we thank you for your presence that's in this place. And just like Dustin read that scripture, we're invited to come boldly into your throne, into your presence to find grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. It's like Jesus is just opening the door for us to come. And so I pray as we're gathered together here that the Spirit of God would fill us, renew our minds, refresh our hearts. Fill us with your love today so that we can show love to those around us especially those who may be unlovable. We don't want to love from our own strength, our own willpower. We want to love because Christ loved us first. And so we thank you for that. And we just say today, have your way in our lives, have your way in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. And if you're in agreement with that, would you say amen? Amen. amen. So good to worship together. You can go ahead and be seated. Thank you, worship team. You know, I wanted to just say thank you on behalf of our family. Thank you for your prayers and support for us as we've been walking through the loss of my mom. It means so much. I'm so grateful to be a part of this community. So thank you so much. I want to give you an opportunity to give in our regular tithes and offerings today. You know, God has given this church worship center a mission, and our mission is to lead people to be growing followers of Jesus. I think it's important for you to know how do we accomplish our mission. And so uh, over the last two months, you know, at the end of each service, almost every week, we give an invitation for people to respond to salvation make a decision to follow Jesus. And when they respond by raising their hands, we hand out a Bible. And January and February, the last two months of this year, we've handed out 60 Bibles to people. That means 60 people making a decision, they're going to follow Jesus. Now, I always like to say, 
We don't know what actually is going on in their hearts, and there may be some people who just want a free Bible. I don't know. Um, but we'll give as many Bibles away as we can. But what's even more exciting to me is people taking their next step to be water baptized. And the next baptism that we have here in a couple weeks, we have over 40 people registered for that baptism, taking their next step, both young people and people of all ages. And so I'm so excited about that. Another way we accomplish our mission here, uh, last Sunday, we had over 480 children, birth through fourth grade, attend on Sunday morning. Yeah, so if you serve in kids' ministry, you already know that's great. We built this addition you know, last year, and we've been paying, working at paying it off, and it's getting filled up by a lot of children. And it's an amazing opportunity for us to lead these young people to be growing followers of Jesus. What a privilege it is. It also provides a need for us to serve. We need many, many people serving in that area. If you are serving in that area now, I just want to thank you so much. You're not just meeting a need. You are pouring into these young people's lives. There's also more opportunities. So if God is prompting you, whether you have children or not, if you don't have children, I would say, especially to you, would you consider serving in this area and making a difference in these young people's lives? And you can do that by going to worshipcenter.org slash serve and, and get involved that way. Just invite many people to participate. We'd love to have you be a part of it. But when you give financially to this church, it supports. That's just a few ways of how we accomplish our mission. But when you give here, that's supporting that ministry financially. It allows us to continue to lead more people to be growing followers of Jesus. So if you'd like to give, you can see how to do that. You can give online, you can drop a gift off in the boxes at the doors. Um, but I'm so grateful for the generosity of this church, believing in a mission that God has given us. So let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity we have to sow our seed of finances into your kingdom. And it is like a seed planted. I believe it's going to multiply in many people, making a difference in many people's lives. How we communicate and bring the good news of who Jesus is, because it's only the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that's going to transform someone's life. So that's where we want to be. That's what we want to do in alignment with your will. So we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, sir. Are you ready for God's word today? All right. Well, I'm excited to bring it. This is part five of our series, and we're bringing it to a close today. Today, I want to talk to you at this final part of Joseph's life, because we've been looking at the story of Joseph over these five weeks. And I want to talk to you about God's forgiveness, how this shows up. And what we're going to do is look at Genesis chapter 42 through 50, nine chapters I'm going to summarize in about 30 minutes, all right? No big deal. That's the challenge ahead. But we're going to look at how Joseph was this example of God's forgiveness and reconciliation, both of those. Now, I want to take you back a couple years ago. I was driving our minivan in the parking lot of Costco, and if... Oh, if you've never driven in Costco's parking lot, you, for some reason, that parking lot just seems like they've used every square inch for something. So there's no margin at all. And I'm not very good at parking a minivan to begin with, but it's very challenging in that uh, parking lot. So that particular day, I'm very carefully, very slowly backing out of a parking space, looking both ways. I have the, the camera you know, that I'm looking back and I'm just backing up slowly. And all of a sudden, this other minivan comes flying down the row and clips my bumper. Now, who was in the wrong in that situation? <laughs> Clearly, I was not in the wrong. And so we got out and um, I'll never forget the lady got out of her minivan and she looked at our, both of our cars because there was a dent in both of them. And I'll never forget. She said something like, oh, I can't believe you backed into my car. I was like, I said, well, I'm going to call the police and we'll help, you know, they'll help us get this figured out. And she was very nice about it. And so I called the police and they basically said, Hey, it happened in a private parking lot like that. We don't get involved. You're both going to have to call your insurance companies, explain to them what happened. And then they determine, you know, the ruling on this. And I said, no problem. I'm sure they're going to see it my way. So thank you, officer. And so my assumption is that both of us called our insurance companies and both of us defended how we were not in the wrong. And if you want to know the, 
the result of that was we were both in the wrong and our insurance companies had to pay for both of us. So there wasn't really a wrong or right party, but it, it, it revealed to me something about human nature. Humans, we humans, we are so skilled at justifying our own behavior. And we're, we tend to judge other people based on external actions, and we tend to judge ourselves based on our own good intentions. Have you ever noticed that? And so every day we have this opportunity and then we have interactions with coworkers and family members and neighbors and boss and customers, if you're in customer service and even church community, we have opportunities where we will be wronged or we will experience offense and we'll have those opportunities to justify why we are in the wrong and it's somebody else's fault. So how do we respond in those situations? If I always think about if it's whatever our human instinct is, I want to pay attention. Well, what does God's word teach in this situation? And the Bible teaches us not by lectures and not by, you know, textbooks. This, this really isn't a textbook. The Bible teaches us primarily through biography, through stories, real life stories of real life human beings. And these stories reveal who God is. And these stories reveal the human condition and what God has done about it, what he has done to redeem and restore. And so as we've been looking at this story of Joseph over these few weeks, the story of Joseph reveals a lot about the human condition, but also reveals a lot about the character of God and who Jesus is, why he came. So when we talk about forgiveness and reconciliation, it's really important to understand the difference. And I want to encourage you to write this down because forgiveness is a decision. But reconciliation is a process of rebuilding trust. So you can forgive someone without reconciling the relationship, but you cannot reconcile a relationship without forgiveness. And so as we look at God's forgiveness today, what I want to do is I want us to understand from the story of Joseph how God forgives. And to do that, we're going to look at Joseph. Remember, Joseph is a clear illustration pointing to who Jesus is. He's not Jesus. He's still human. He was, this was a human story, but points to Jesus. And so it's very tempting to kind of put ourselves in Joseph's, uh, identify with Joseph. What would I do if I was treated like Joseph was? But I want us to resist that temptation because Joseph points to who Jesus is. And, and I want us instead to identify with Joseph's brothers. Remember, his brothers betrayed Joseph, sold him as a slave, treated him as a criminal. And I want us to see how Joseph responded to that to help us understand God's forgiveness. Because before we can forgive other people, before we can reconcile our relationships with others, we must understand God's forgiveness and his reconciliation in our relationship with him. All right, so let's go to Genesis chapter 42. And many scholars believe this took place about 20 years after Joseph's brother sold him as a slave. So we've been on this journey getting to know Joseph. He is now second in command in Egypt. He's in this very powerful position and his brothers show up 20 years later. Genesis 42 verse six, let's read. Since Joseph was governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. When they arrived, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from? He demanded. From the land of Canaan, they replied. We have come to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. And he remembered the dreams he'd had about them many years before. Just imagine the emotions Joseph must be feeling in this moment. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. 
No, my Lord, they exclaimed. Your servants have simply come to buy food. We are all brothers, members of the same family. We are honest men, sir. We are not spies. Yes, you are, Joseph insisted. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. Sir, they said, there are actually 12 of us. We, your servants, are all brothers, sons of a man living in the land of Canaan. Our youngest brother is back there with our father right now, and one of our brothers is no longer with us. But Joseph insisted, as I said, you are spies, and this is how I will test your story. I swear by the life of Pharaoh that you will never leave Egypt unless your youngest brother comes here. One of you must go and get your brother. I'll keep the rest of you here in prison. Then we'll find out whether or not your story is true. By the life of Pharaoh, if it turns out that you don't have a younger brother, then I'll know you are spies. As I've been studying this story, my assumption is that Joseph already forgave his brothers for what they had done to him. Scripture does not clearly state that, but when we've gotten to know the character of Joseph, I believe he forgave his brothers. I believe there's evidence that you see that. But he did not have to face his brothers and know what that relationship would look like until this moment. And so what I see that's going on here is that he needed some tests to show, are his brothers still the same liars and still treat people the same as he was treated? And so this first test was he gave, he sold them grain, and I'll summarize this next couple chapters. He sold them grain, and then he had a manager put their money back in the grain sacks. And so the brothers went home, back to their father Jacob, to the land of Canaan. They opened up their grain sacks, and they saw all of their money was there. What would they do in that moment? That was the first test. Well, they used up all their grain and the famine was so severe that Jacob said, we need to go buy more grain from Egypt. And so he said, you guys need to go back to Egypt. And the brother said, we can't go back there unless we take Benjamin with us. And Jacob said, no, I don't want you to take him. I've already lost one son. I don't want to lose a second one. Eventually, Jacob relented and he allowed the brothers to take Benjamin with them. They go back to Egypt. The first thing the brothers do is they go to the manager and said, hey, when we got home, all of our money was in our grain sacks. We want to give it back. We get a little window that their character had changed. Manager said, nope, your bill's been taken care of. And so Joseph invites them into this big feast and treats them very kindly still doesn't reveal who he is, and then sends them back with more grain. But he has his manager put Joseph's silver cup into Benjamin's sack of grain. Sends them on their way. They did not know it was there. A day's journey later, Joseph sends his manager and says, I want you to go get the person, uh, the, the cup back. And so the manager goes and they find it and said, whoever has this silver cup in their bag, they have stolen it and they're going to be captured and be the slave of Joseph for the rest of their life. So the brother was like, hey, we didn't steal anything. Go search our bags. So they search every single brother. They come to Benjamin's bag. They open it up, and there is the silver cup. And you can just imagine how the brothers felt in that moment. Benjamin, how could you steal this? You're going to be a slave now. And so they bring the brothers back to, to Joseph. And these brothers are pleading and begging for mercy. And we see another window into the change of heart from these brothers. And I want to read this, pick it up in Genesis 44, starting at verse 32. Judah steps forward and he says this, my Lord, I guarantee to my father that I would take care of the boy. I told him if I don't bring him back to you, I will bear the blame forever. We get a little window into Judah's character representing his brothers. Verse 33, so please, my Lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. For how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? I couldn't bear to see the anguish this would cause my father. So now we see that Judah was not just repentant 
in attitude or words, but in actions. He said, I will stay here and be your slave in exchange for my brother Benjamin. And we see this change of behavior that these brothers who said, forget Joseph when they were, when they were younger, they uh, hated him so much that they would have sold him into slavery and then lied to his father about that. These same brothers had such a change of heart. And now Judah was going to exchange his life, lay it down for his brother. I believe it was in that moment Joseph saw there was real change that took place. And so Genesis 45, verse three, Joseph couldn't stand it any more. And he said, I am Joseph. He said to his brothers, is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. Remember? (laughs) Remember that? (laughs) But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. You see the picture we get of Jesus? I mean, as we took communion and we remember Jesus' body was broken, he was betrayed, he was insulted, but he didn't retaliate. He actually knew that that would happen so he could save people's lives. We get a window into this. So this true reconciliation of relationship, we see it unfold. Joseph and the brothers, they go back, they get Jacob, they bring the whole family to move to Egypt. And they have this wonderful reunion, relationship reconciled. Then Jacob, the father, he dies and the brothers get a little bit nervous. What's Joseph going to do once our father has passed away? Maybe he was just being nice to us to honor our father. And so they again went back to Joseph and said, please forgive us for what we have done to you. And I want you to see how Joseph responds to this in Genesis chapter 50. This is kind of the last moment we hear of Joseph, the last things that he says. And this is so powerful. Genesis 50, starting in verse 19, responding to his brothers. He says, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. This story of Joseph is a, one of the most beautiful, powerful explanations of what forgiveness and true reconciliation is. We know that relationship, relationship with God, relationship with people, relationship is built on trust. And it's sin that breaks that trust between God and mankind. It's sin that breaks that trust between people, a person to a person. That's the human condition. Yet God sent his son, Jesus, not just for the forgiveness of sins, but to reconcile, to rebuild that trust in that relationship. And so I want to give you what this four step reconciliation process is. And, and again, it's going to be tempting to jump to reconciling person to person, but I want us to first think about what is a forgiveness and reconciled relationship with God? What does that look like? What does that process look like? So I want to encourage you to write this down. Number one, first step is to understand forgiveness. Forgiveness means the debt of sin is canceled because someone has paid for it. And that someone is Jesus. Ephesians chapter one, verse seven, Paul says this. He says, he, meaning God, is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Forgiveness means the debt of your sin has been paid in full. 
But that's not a license to do whatever you want or live however you want. Forgiveness is not justifying injustice. Forgiveness is not excusing bad behavior. Forgiveness is not turning a blind eye to sin. Forgiveness is a gift. You can't earn it. It's freely given. And it doesn't stop there. Forgiveness takes you to that next step. And that's confession. And confession means that nothing is hidden. Confession is this honest vulnerability before God, even though it costs you, because nothing is hidden before God. No sin is hidden before God. John, one of the disciples who walked with Jesus, he wrote this in his letter, 1 John 1, 9. He said, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. So just like sunlight is one of the best disinfectants to kill a virus and to kill bacteria, confessing your sin is bringing your sin into the light, kills that virus of sin, gets rid of that guilt and shame that comes by bringing, confessing your sin to God. It's the key that unlocks the freedom that God wants you to experience so that the guilt and shame of what you've done in your past doesn't hold you down. Confession is such an important part just to acknowledge and this vulnerability before God does have a cost. But it's what it, me what it means to have clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands mean there's nothing hidden. God knows it all anyway, but I'm just going to confess my sin and, and know that nothing is hidden before God. Pure heart means no ulterior motives for serving God or honoring God. I'm not doing that to get something from him. I'm doing it because I want a relationship with God. Remember, reconciliation is a rebuilding trust. Confession is a very important part of how we rebuild trust in our relationship with God. But that doesn't stop there. It's, it takes us to step number three, repentance. Everybody say repentance. Repentance is shown by turning from your selfish ways. It's shown. It's a change in behavior. Repentance is not about feeling bad for what you've done. Repentance is about, I'm going to show that there's been a change of heart, just like Judah did, just like the brothers did towards Joseph. There was a change. Repentance is a gift. I love what C.S. Lewis said. He wrote that repentance is unlearning self-conceit that humans have been training in for thousands of years. We are, I mean, generation after generation, it's like we pass down from one human generation to the next how to be self-centered. And it shows up in all kinds of areas of our lives in very small ways. Can I give you a couple examples? When you are part of a picture, you're taking a selfie and you're in a group photo, how do you determine that that picture is a good picture? <laughs> Let me say it this way. Who is the first person you look at in that picture to decide if that's a good picture or not? You. I mean, everyone could have their eyes closed and their tongue hanging out, but as long as you look good, it's like, that's a great picture. <laughs> I do it too. But imagine getting to the place, and this is such a simple example, but imagine getting to the place where you are in a picture like that and you just say, hey, you decide which one you want to choose. And you think to yourself, because your mindset is, I am not going to get my validation and I'm not going to find my identity from what other people think about how I look. That went over really big. How do you respond when a coworker takes credit for your good idea? Has that ever happened? Oh, I've, you feel the human instinct of 
self-centered and say, hold on a second. I mean, it's a really good idea. It was your idea. Maybe it saved the company money or maybe it earned the company money. And, and you see it as a way that that idea that you thought of, that you came up with, would may op open the door for more opportunities in the future. And they took credit for that. We judge other people by external actions, but judge ourselves by our good intentions. Imagine if you could get to the place where it was like, I don't care who gets the credit for that because God is my defender. And when he wants to open the door for more opportunities, he's going to open that door. My identity is going to be in him, not what other people think about. You know, pastors deal with this too. Did you know that? You know, for me to stand up on a platform like this, to bring God's word to you, it's such a privilege. It's such an opportunity. And when I deliver a sermon and then someone says to me, man, that was a great sermon. I know what the right response is. You know, it's like, oh, it was all God. <laughs> but I always think like, well, if it was all God, it probably would have been way better. It wasn't that good. But there's something inside that it's like, yeah, well, yeah, I put a lot of effort into that and I prepared well and I appreciate that. And over time, I have to guard against that. And I think pastors have to guard against not finding validation from people's response. Because I know there will be a time when I'm not standing on this platform. You know, just this series, this Joseph series, a five week series, I did two of the five messages because of what our family was walking through. So three out of those five, someone else, I wasn't even really involved in the service. Do you know how many people came to me and said how good those services were? <laughs> how good the messages were? Now, I know what the right response is. Yeah, we have an amazing team. They were good. I'm so thankful for the team. But if I'm honest, you don't mind me being honest, right? <laughs> I can't help but think, wait, those were so good and I didn't even have a part in them. <laughs> but I know there will be a day that I won't be on this platform. Now, when I st stepped in into this role, from my perspective, I'm thinking 25 years in this role. So I'm seven years into it. As far as I can tell, this is not a stepping stone to something else. I'm here. I'm committed here. Unless the Lord leads otherwise, which I hold everything with an open hand because I just want to be in his will. But it's from my human understanding, understanding, Kelly and I are here 25 years. Uh, I don't have 40 years in me like Pastor Sam, but I got 25, I think, doing this role. <laughs> but I know at some point there will be a day when I step off of this platform and I step into the shadows. And in that moment, I want to make sure that my relationship is built on an identity of who God created me to be and not validated by what other people think of me. And that's what I want for you. That's what reconciliation is. Reconciliation, and I want you to write this down, is a restored relationship status with God because of rebuilt trust. God is rebuilding trust so that you trust him and that he can trust you. That's what a relationship built on trust is. Yes, you're forgiven the guilt of your sin, your shame, your past. That's not going to be held against you. But there's a process to rebuild trust with God, to be trustworthy and to find your validation, your identity in a relationship with God, not with other people. Because as soon as you find your relationship uh, validation and try to find approval from other people, it will always lead you to be let down. But when you have your relationship with God and you find your identity in a forgiven, reconciled relationship with God, that's how you can then live out forgiveness and reconciliation with other people. Because you're not trying to find approval from people. This is the ministry of reconciliation Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. And I want to close with this. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, a relationship with God being reconciled first before we think about reconciling our relationship with other people, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us the 
followers of Jesus, he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us so that when you have a right relationship with God and you have this restored relationship built on trust, I trust you, God, with my life, and God can trust you and entrust you with more responsibility in life. That's how you can be a good example for other people to follow. That's what it means. He's making his appeal through you and the way that you live your life. So we speak for Christ, Paul continues, when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. God has reconciled us through Christ and he has given us this message of reconciliation. And I'm done for today. <laughs> Let's take a moment to reflect on this because I just want to run through these one more time. Forgiveness is a gift. Nothing you can do to earn it. Nothing you can do to earn God's forgiveness. And really there's nothing you can do to earn someone's forgiveness. If it was, it wouldn't have the word give in it. We'd have to call it for earnness or something. I don't know. But I want to ask you, have you received this gift of forgiveness from God? Number two, confession. You know, confession takes courage. It is not weak. It's a place of strength to just say, here I am, the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's a cost to it. But bringing your sin out of darkness into the light is the pathway to freedom. And I want you to experience freedom. So is there anything hidden in your life? Confess. Third is repentance. Repentance is shown. It's not just this concept. It's not just this idea. I don't know what your understanding of repentance is, but I used to think that repentance was like, feel bad. Hopefully you feel bad enough and then you're going to change. And I, don't, I just think that is not what scripture teaches. It's not about feeling bad so you change. It's about changing because you love God so much. So are there any selfish behaviors that you need to change? And then reconciliation. It's restoration. And I love that because the first four letters of restoration is rest. Ah, oh, rest in your relationship with God. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We love your word. And we're so grateful for the spirit of God that opens our eyes to see truth. And it's the truth that sets us free. I pray we would have the courage to face truth head on. Listen, change, rest. I know these kind of messages, it's easy to think of other people that should have been here to hear it. It's easy to have that perspective. Yep, tell them, pastor, they need to hear this. I pray that we would personalize it, search our own hearts. And God, I do pray that we, there would be a new level, a deeper level of rest in our relationship with you. Our identity would be found in our relationship with you, found in what it is to be forgiven, found in what it is to be free, free from the power of sin controlling our lives, free from falling short. And when we do fall short, we're quick to confess it and we're quick to say, Holy Spirit, help me change and find rest. And I pray that in Jesus name. Would you just keep your heads bowed for a moment? Because I don't want to dismiss without giving you an opportunity today. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, Maybe you've been in church before, or maybe this is your first time in any church. 
You know God's got his eye on you. God's got his eye on the sparrow. He's got his eye on you. He sees you. He knows where you've been. He knows what you're going through right now. And while our human instinct is to say, let me clean up my life and then I'll come to God. And God is saying, no, come. Bring everything that you are and let me transform your life. Let go. That's what surrender is. So if you're ready to make that decision today, I want to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to invite you just to repeat this prayer out loud after me. I'm going to invite everyone to pray just so nobody's praying alone. So would you say this? Would you say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he came to this earth, died on a cross, was buried in a tomb, rose from the dead, and ascended to heaven. I repent of my sins, receive forgiveness of my sins, and I choose Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. That prayer, if you sincerely meant it in your heart, and the words that you said, it sets you on a new path. And as a church, we want to walk alongside you. So I'm just going to ask you to do something that takes courage in a room like this. If you made that decision and prayed that prayer for the first time, or you know it was a decision you had to make, the ushers have a Bible for you. So would you have the courage just to put your hand up in the air unashamed of this decision until they see you and they'll hand you that Bible? This is not meant to embarrass you. It's meant to, for us to celebrate this decision with you. And then after the service, I want to invite you to stop by our connections rooms on either side of the auditorium. We have a team of people in there that would love to talk with you and pray with you and help you take your next step because this journey of faith is not meant to be walked alone. And if you've made a decision to follow Jesus, your next step is to be water baptized. Water baptism is a very important step for the believer, the person who has made the decision because you're identifying with Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. So when you go down into the water, it's like your old life is gone. You come up out of the water. You're a new creation. So it allows your mind and your heart, everything to be transformed, to, to physically experience that, but also spiritually experience that. A new creation in Christ. So I want to encourage you to be water baptized. If you never have been, you can sign up uh, online, worshipcenter.org slash baptism, and we'll help you take that next step. All right? Well, can we thank God for his word today? And man, I pray that it challenges you and encourages you. You can go ahead and stand. If you need prayer for any reason, we'll have a prayer team down front. We'd love to pray with you. If you're new to Worship Center, make sure you stop by Connections. We'd love to help you get connected. Next week, we start a brand new teaching series. It's our Easter series called Christ Crucified. The Apostle Paul made this statement. I've determined not to know anything else except Christ and him crucified. Why do you say that? That's what we're going to talk about next week through Easter. Hey, don't forget, you are God's masterpiece. You've been created on purpose for a purpose. So go out this week, pursue the purpose God has in your life. Have a great week. We'll see you here.